everybody. Uh, we are here uh, for the sixth uh, GN Ramachandran lecture that we have uh, very lucky to have Professor Chandrika Shah with us to deliver the lecture. Uh, to begin with, I request our team academic, Professor Amita uh, Kulahiri, to introduce to this uh, Ramachandran lecture. This is a series of, we have a series of lectures on uh, different physicists or uh, scientists. So, Professor Nahi is with about the Ramachandran. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, welcome to the sixth year of general lecture at the International Center of Physical Sciences. We have four main lecture, lectures after four famous scientists. We, of course, we have a book memorial lecture. We also have a CKM memorial lecture named after our first director, Dr. CKM Ajinda. And we also have a Chandrasekhar Memorial Lecture, named after Subramanian and Chandrasekhar. And this is usually uh, given by somebody in astrophysics to gravitation. And finally, you also have the G.N. Ramachandran Memorial Lecture. Uh, so this is named after G.N. Ramachandran, the famous biophysicist, I should say. He was a physicist who uh, moved into biology and uh, studied the structure of peptides and also the first to suggest the triple helical structure of collagen. Um, we have the Ramachandran model lecture to highlight research in biology, biological sciences, and biophysics and biochemistry as well. So today we have the sixth Zian Ramachandran model lecture and to introduce the speaker today, the invited as director of the Institute of Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the sixth GN Ramachandran Memorial Lecture. And as our dean, if he said, it's primarily for the people not necessarily to be hardcore biologists, but people who are interested in the topic of biology. Even a physicist can be interested. So, looking at the series, in fact, the previous uh, G. N. Ramachandran lecture, the fifth one, was delivered by Dan Funkel, who was actually a physicist, but working in the area of biology. And this institute primarily is the physics institute, but I think biology is probably the important area or field that's going to be the topic of the future and already is the topic of the current time. So every other field like physics and chemistry does make the connection. And today we are extremely happy to have a very accomplished speaker in this series, uh, Professor Chandrima Shah. And uh, I need to introduce Professor Shah. Actually, Professor Shah has broken the so-called stereotype or glass ceiling in many different one, of course, she is, she is the first ever woman president of INSA. That's already breaking up the ceiling. So previous to that, she was director of National Institute of Immunology. She was also vice president of the International Affairs of INSA. She holds many, many different responsibilities other than being a very, very accomplished biologist. But the other stereotype, which I was not aware, she was also a cricketer. She was vice captain of the West Bengal cricket team. And she was also in All India Radio. She was a commentator. So that's also, I think, breaking another series. It's a stereotype we have. The women neither can be you know, president or something, can be a director, can be accomplished scientist, can be also a cricket. And in fact, you can read about all her accomplishments in the you know, file sketch that is given in the poster. I don't have much to add on it because almost all the awards you can think of, all the coveted fellowships you can think of, 
She has all of that. She is fellow of all three national academies, fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, fellow of the Westminster Academy of Science. She has the run, she has won the Rand Boxing Prize. You know, the list is very long. But I also found she has actually, in some way, connection to SN2 Center, although she is not a physicist by training. Her parents are also very famous. A father from Mushawa, he was a very, very famous photographer and photographer of Ravindranath Tagore. And her mother was a very famous painter and painted, sketched, yes, and goes. And she has all these photos, and Essen Bowles visited all the photo exhibition, not all, maybe at least some of the photo exhibition of her mother, Koruna Shah. So in some way, you know, this world is all connected. I feel extremely connected. So uh, she was actually very glad to see our Bowles archive. And I do hope with her kind permission, at least some of the replicas of this photo will be able to put out soon. And today she is going to talk about a very fascinating title, Ourselves to Our Rescue. You know, our cells die and grow, and how do they die? How do they get reborn? And the balance between the two, that keeps us alive. So that's exactly what she's going to talk about. So I welcome Professor Shaha. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It was pretty detailed. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I must first uh, thank your director, uh, Dr. Tanushri Sadar Gupta, for inviting me here and also the faculty. And I interacted with some faculty, and uh, I'm really happy. Uh, so um, thank you. And uh, it is a matter of honor for me to be delivering the sixth Jain Ramachandran Memorial Lecture. And it has a formidable line, uh, you know, lineup of who spoke. But today, uh, I decided to speak uh, not really on cell death, but on the progress that cell biology has made. And I have an ulterior motive is to sort of, in, uh, you know, entice young scientists to go get into the field, because this is really a field which is growing. And, uh, you know, the last century was uh, the century of genes. And cell biologists say that this is the century of cells. Because with the amount, within the backdrop of the kind of knowledge that we have generated on signaling pathways, on um, metabolic pathways, and all, in general on the physiology of the cell, that now we are able to use cells for, um, for uh, you know, treatment for alleviation of human suffering, for, uh, you know, the betterment of society. So I also understand ourselves, who we are with the cells and our relationship to nature. So is it possible to have a hand mic? Because Hello, can you hear me? So this actually, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So um, <coughs> the reason I wanted this here because it gives me a little bit of flexibility. So um, you know, I first because this is about uh, this name. This lecture is named after uh, Professor Ramachandran. I just wanted to show his uh, photograph with uh, the collagen uh, triple helix, which. Uh, you know, he was the first to propose, and it is one of the seminal discoveries in science. He was a great visionary at science, of science, and he um, also created the Ramachandran plot, 
which is used by the structural biologist, the word oak. So if you talk about cells, you know, yeah, the, uh, I'm sure every, each one of you have seen the structure of cells with its complicated array of uh, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria. And so the cell is a very complicated machine. And there, there, is, there are a whole lot of pathways that goes on in the cell, the signaling pathways, the metabolic pathways. And it is intriguing that how, how um, you know, how complicated it can get. But still, there, I mean, we are living. And uh, the, the, there are, when there are conflicts, then there is pathology. So exactly how many cells do we have in our body? The, the number is calculated as 37 to 50 trillion cells that we have. So amongst these cells, you know, in a, in a given day, as we sit here, 10 to the power 11 cells die in us. So cells are dying and cells are being born. So it is estimated that within a year, you lose so much cells that you actually lose your entire body weight. So, um, so it is important that the balance between cell death and cell survival is maintained. That is how we keep our um, well-being, and that is how the body homeostasis is maintained. So it is, uh, the cell death actually occurs through three main pathways, primary pathways. One is through cell death receptor pathway, one is through the mitochondria, and one is through the granzyme. I will touch upon this because this has to, something to do with the lecture I will give. And this, these are the pathways that I'm not going to go through or talk about it. But the cell survival and cell death pathways are the pathways, especially the cell death pathways. If they are delayed, for example, if the cell death pathway is not working properly, then cancer happens because cells are not allowed to die when they were supposed to die. So now, why, why cells are called cells? I don't know how many of you know. Uh, Robert Hooke was a polymath. He was a great scientist who used to design towns, you know, plan the drainage system of London. So he, he was a, a polymath, but he invented the microscope. And exactly it's, the concept was there because another uh, Danish uh, spect spectacle maker who used uh, this microscope, he, who made a crude microscope, and he improved upon that. And he made the microscope, and he cut slices of corks. You know, corks are dead tissue. So he made slices of corks, and he showed that these are his drawings, that this is what he saw under the microscope. So he, he was actually looking at cell membranes with holes in it, where the cytoplasm of the cell cytoplasm is gone. So it looked to him like the rooms, the small rooms, that in the seminaries, priests used to stay. And they were called cells. So he coined the term cell, and that cell has stayed with us forever. The uh, person who actually, for the first time, saw a living cell is Antoni van Dierdhoek, who was a Dutch draper. And um, draper meaning he was, a, he was a tailor and a draper who used to deal with clothes. And he actually was looking at uh, the thickness of the threads with the microscope. So one day, he decided to turn his microscope towards some water he collected from the drains. And it amazed him with the amount of things going around, moving around. It was an entirely new world, which the whole world has not seen before. And he called these uh, as animal cues meaning small animals. And he made many drawings, as you can see here, one, that he made drawings like this, but he has made exquisite drawings. And I will urge you to go to the Royal Society Archives on the net and see the exquisite drawings he made. I mean, they are really, really remarkable. He's, he sent his drawings and his uh, items to Robert Hook. And as I said, he was president of the Royal Society at one time, and he, looked and realized the importance of the ad hoc observations. And at a time when uh, nobody thought this could happen, a draper became the fellow of Royal Society in England. He was not a scientist. This is because he actually appreciated the significance of his discovery. 
because this changed the biology forever. So this was Anton Van Leeuwenhoek. His stories are very interesting. If you read, you can find it in various uh, journals. It's really an um, interesting journey for Leeuwenhoek. So uh, then uh, eventually, in a sense, uh, cells, uh, looking at cells evolved and looked at cells. So Theodor Schwann was a physiologist, and Matthias Seiden was a botanist. And what they did was, after work, they used to meet in cafes in Bernie. And when they did that, they used to talk about the remarkable similarity they were seeing between plants and animals, the, the unit of the structure. So they proposed in 1839 the cell theory. What was the cell theory? Cell theory was that cells are basic, basic unit of life. All animals, plants are composed of cells. And body of an organism is composed of cells, and cells arise from pre-existing ones. So this was the cell theory, and what you see here is a drawing in the 1900s uh, by Wilson, where you see dividing cells, resting cells, and uh, in cells in various stages of mitosis. You must have read about mitosis. Now, uh, as the days went by. The cells began to be cultured in vitro, in media. So in 1907, Ross Granville Harrison, who was the first person to culture cells, he was looking for the nerve cell growth in frogs, and he was the first one. Then in 1912, 1923, and 1943, several advances took place. And in between, a lot of research was done on how to culture cells. And in 1943, Wilson Earl established the first continuous cell line. In 1952, George Guy established the first continuous immortal human cell line from, from a survival carcinoma in a patient named Henrietta Lacks. And this cell line, in a way, changed the course of cell biology. How? This is the statue of her impact, her impact of her tumor was such that her statue is erected in John Hopkins. And so these are what you see are HeLa cells. One is a scanning electron micrograph and the other is uh, just cells like that. But it is a long story, actually. So Henrietta died on uh, October 4, 1951 of cervical cancer. And these cells were then taken out by the physician and given to Dr. John Guy who cultured it in the, in the, in the, in the uh, laboratory. And they were growing at a terrifying speed. And they were all surprised by this. So more than 50 million tons of Henrietta cells have been grown since she died in 1951. And there are so many cells are still growing. So in a way, Henrietta is still alive. And 110,000 publications that mention the use of HeLa cells between 19... Uh, 53 and 2018 was um, there. There are more and more publications are coming out, and the number must have increased by now. Now, it is interesting that two Nobel Prizes are directly linked to healer cells. Dr. Hausen got the 2008 Nobel for showing that viruses can cause cancer. In the original biopsy of Henrietta Lacks' survival cancer, a human papillomavirus 18 was found. And um, then he predicted that cervical cancer is caused by a virus, human papillomavirus. And based on that, the cervical cancer vaccine came out. And that saved many, many people. So he got the Nobel in 2008 for that. Then he, his experiments with the HeLa cells actually uh, found a new pathway. Then Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel in 2009, her entire study was using HeLa cells. What she did, she looked at telomeres, which are ends of the chromosomes, and actually regulated aging. So they also discovered the enzyme telomerase. Then the polio vaccine, you, all of you must have heard of polio vaccine. So polio vaccine is now we are on 99% polio free. Why? Because Jonas Sack Institute actually tested the first polio vaccine, he made a polio vaccine, he first tested it in HeLa cells. And what was important is HeLa cells were not dying by the infection. They were in fact growing very well with the, with the, with the, with the polio virus. 
infection. He transfected the cells with the polio virus. Now, he needed a lot of healer cells to make the polio vaccine. So, a factory was created in Alabama, in the USA, to make healer cells so that the vaccine can be made. And healer cells actually, as I said, grew at terrifying rate. At one point of time, it actually uh, infected many other cultures, which is another story. But Jonas Sachs uh, vaccine came out, and you know what has happened to polio that it's almost uh, eradicated. So now, uh, Rebecca Sklow, who is an investigative scientist, he, she actually started looking for the family of Hina, Camille And uh, she wrote a book on uh, the immortal life of Henry Delax. And this book was on the bestseller list of New York Times for six years. And what this uh, book actually revealed is the research that has been done with HeLa cells is the unethical use of cells and the, 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 the viol ethical violations and, and, and racism what about that. Now, in, 19, in, in 2021, the HeLa cell estate actually sued Thermo Fisher Scientific and last month, in August, the, trial, the results of the trial came out. And there was a settlement of an undisclosed amount with the family on, on the cells. So uh, this, uh, this also brought out uh, many ethical issues. And Nature published an article on August 4 that it really, we have to really know from where things are coming from and how we are using it and whether we have the authority to use it. Because in uh, March, 2013, EMBL, EMBL and they published the sequence of the HeLa cell, cell genome. Now you realize that when you publish genome of a cell, which belonged to my grandmother, that's what they said, that my sequences are also sort of the disease propensity, etc., should be known from this. So they also went after this, uh, uh, this uh, NIH, after this Rebecca uh, Sklut wrote this book, and the NIH made a deal with them. We don't know the details of the deal, but there was a deal. So this, uh, we should also think about whether DNA sequences can be put up without the concept of the family or patient. So this was the story about HeLa cell because I wanted to say that HeLa cells also helped us to understand ethics because of this uh, legal suits, etc., which is an inherent part of science now, that you should be following good ethical practices. Now, um, the, 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 the doctor who took out the biopsy of the cell, uh, a biopsy of Henry um uh, was Dr. Howard Jones. He later pioneered the in vitro fertilization technique, and he was responsible for the first test tube baby born in, uh, you, in the United States. Now, in a way, in vitro fertilization is also cell transfer, because here the sperm is in, injected into the egg, so you are transferring one cell into another. And by the number of in vitro fertilization clinics that you see today, we know that this, um, uh, this process was revolutionary because this has solved the problem of so many infertile couples. And uh, so Robert Edwards won the Nobel Prize in 2010 for, uh, for actually inventing this technique where the first uh, test tube baby, Louise Brown, was born in UK in 1978. 70 days after, say, 67 days to be precise, uh, after Louise Brown was born, Durga was born in Kolkata, by where Dr. Shubhash Mukhopadhyay was the doctor. Most unfortunately, Shubhash Mukhopadhyay committed suicide because people were not wanting to believe him. But later on, he was given the credit of having the first test tube baby in India by the ICMR centers. So, um, so this was about the in vitro fertilization, and that's a cell therapy, which I will not go in very much detail today. But in addition to the whole spermatozoa, now immature spermatozoa can be matured in the laboratory and used when men are oligospermic, like they are not having enough spermatozoa. They, that can also be used for to treat infertile couples. Now, coming to immune cells, because it's very important because immune cells have been used extensively to, to bring out these, uh, you know, therapies. So, Mechenikov was a Russian scientist who discovered 
the cell macrophage. And uh, uh, the Ralph Steinman discovered the cell dendritic cell. These, I am not sure if uh, people only very familiar with the neurology will know about these cells. These are called antigen presenting cells. They're very important cells for us because they fight for us. They are our protectors. So these two cells, and uh, Steinman got the Nobel in 2011 for uh, discovering this dendritic cell. And it's an interesting anecdote I just wanted to say that Steinman, the Nobel Prize is never given posthumously. Steinman on a Friday was you know, very ill with pancreatic cancer. He said that I will have to live till Monday to get the Nobel Prize because he had an inkling that he would get, but he died on Friday. And on Monday, Nobel Prize was announced in which there was the name of Ralph Steinman because they didn't know he has died. So there was a furor after this and uh, there was a lot of controversy, but eventually his name was kept because it was already announced. So Ralph Steinman um, discovered this. And so other two cell types that are very important are cytotoxic T cells that we see, and the helper T cell and the B cells, these are all the immune cells that protect us. So you should know them very well, because these cells are very, very important for us. <coughs> what happens with the antigen protect, uh, uh, processing is that when we are exposed to uh, bacteria, or a virus, the dendritic cells actually recognize these and the macrophages also. They chew them up and break them down into small fragments. These fragments are expressed on the surface of macrophages and dendritic cells, as you can see here. And once these are expressed, the T cells of our body run and recognize these uh, antigens by, by, uh, by their own receptors. And so they are now educated. The T cells are now trained and educated. What they can do? The helper T cells can go to the B cells and tell them to make antibodies. The whole concept of vaccination that so much you've heard about during the COVID-19 um, yeah. pandemic, that uh, the antibodies are made. Cytotoxic T cells have a different task. They go and uh, uh, they kill the patho uh, pathogenic cell or any tumor cell that they can see. So this is in a nutshell what happens. It's a very, very complicated process that I have just made with one stroke of a pen, but it's very, very, very complicated. Now, the, if you see, look at the immune cell interactions. This is a this is a scanning electron micrograph of a dendritic cell talking to a T cell, and it's pseudo colored. But you see the, the, the this this conversation is actually this complicated. It has many molecules expressed on the surface of the T cell and the dendritic cell. And they are talking to each other. Here is the MHC molecule, which actually presents those chewed up antigens to the T cell. T cell gets trained, educated, and then goes, the helper cell goes to the B cell, talks with an equally complicated signaling system, and tells it to make the antigen. And what the, uh, sorry, uh, tells them to make the antibody. And what the this, uh, T cells, what happens to the cytotoxic T cells, they latch on to the tumor cell or the or the cells that have uh, um, that are infected, and then they release two kinds of uh, proteins. One forms a pore, which is called a buffering protein, and the other one is an enzyme, which comes and just dismantles the. It's like a scissor; it just cuts the cell, and the cell dies. So this is the way cytotoxic T cells um, you know, work. So these are the concepts that were used to make many um, uh, therapies. I'm just giving you one example. Uh, James Allison, who got the Nobel Prize in 2018, actually discovered a protein called CTLA-4, and it seemed that it was putting a break on the T cell. It was silencing the T cells. No, don't go and kill the cell. So he realized that in some situations, this was the reason why this is what he caused. So he, he developed an inhaler, which is called Ipilimubab, and that it helps the diseases to be cured. So he got the Nobel for that. And Tosipo Punjo also got the Nobel because he discovered this programmed cell death protein one, which sticks to the molecule of cancer cells and, and makes it refractory to other uh, cells which are coming to kill it. So that he also found the inhibitor to that. And these are the two inhibitors that are in the market now. So you can see this is an excellent example of a, uh, of a basic medical research going directly to application. So this is very, very inspiring.
So the so the guard B cell therapy came about after this um, after this uh, journey from understanding the T cells. Now can T cells be engineered for specific attack? So T cells are now can be made by genetic engineering can be made to express a chimeric antigen receptor on the surface which has an extracellular binding domain, a transmembrane domain, and a, a transducing ligand and some co-stimulatory molecules. So it's expressed from the T cells. And what happens is this goes, then it recognizes the CD19 antigen on tumor cells and kills the cell. So this is a, a therapy called CAR T cell therapy. So if you look at this, you'll see that how the normal blood smear differs from a person suffering from acute lymphoid leukemia. They most, the blood, it gets arrested. The blood cell formation gets arrested here. And you can see the blood cells here. So the person has to somehow fight this formation of blood cells or get rid of the blood cells. So in CAR T cell therapy, what is done is the, your own T cells are collected, which is a problem actually, but uh, we have come across improving that. So T cells are collected, they are isolated and they are uh, the CAR, CAR antigen is expressed on that. Then the T cells are multiplied and re-injected into the human. And then what happens is these CAR T cells now trained and for recognizing the antigen of the tumor cell goes to the tumors. tumors. And uh, as I showed you that how by using branzyme and porphyrin, they just kill the cell. So this is called the CAR T cell therapy, which is very, very successful in case of the acute lymphoblastic link. So this is how it is, as I said, this is this is how this, it looks. They go and latch onto the cancer cell. And this, uh, uh, they, they, they recognize the receptor of the cancer cell and they release the granzyme and perforin and kills it. So this is a successful uh, uh, therapy that six of them have been approved by the FDA, Federal Drug Administration in the USA. They are being used now. Um, and uh, uh, they, these, uh, the, the more, there are about 700 card therapy registrations, but only six have been approved. But these are the pioneers. Dr. Jung, Carl Jung, is a, a physician who actually made the, how this treatment will be done. He established the process. And Emily Whitehead was the first patient to receive CAR T cell therapy. So these are actually the pioneers. Now, Dr. Jung was not given the Nobel Prize because it was said that the earlier slide I showed you that uh, Tosuko Honjo and Allison was actually the ones who created the theory. And he has used that theory to develop the method. So the basic theory, the person giving the basic theory was given preference in the Nobel Prize. So um, Emily Whitehead, she was treated when she was six years old. Now she is about 17, 18 years old with the CAR T cell therapy, and it has cured her. Now in India, uh, there is a, the IIT Bombay, Bombay team has uh, tested CAR T cell therapy by make the, making the CAR T in India. And there is a Bangalore-based Bangalore uh, startup, Evanil Therapeutics, by Dr. Shridhar Mukherjee and um, Kiran Mojumna Shah Biocon, who has established a facility for making the CAR T cells. But CAR T cells also have its own problems. It is difficult to collect sufficient number of T cells from a person who's suffering from blood cancer. So that's a problem. The second is there is a there is a problem of having too many cytokines released by the T cells that causes cytokine syndrome. And so all these all these uh, factors may restrict the further clinical applications of CAR T cell therapy. So now it is the CAR and T cell therapy. Natural killer cells are fighters of our immune system, and they are called natural killers. And they don't have to be trained like these cells. They are already trained to kill anything foreign in our body. So, uh, so the CAR T cells need this uh, previous training, which is not required. So unlike T cells, uh, they, uh, they require the MHC molecules for uh, the antigen to be presented. They directly recognize uh, target cells and, and uh, and kill, kill them. 
So then NK cells are actually not activated to the MNC pathway and also do not release too much cytokines. They have a different profile, which I make you say. So, and then the cell line, which is called the NK92 cell line. An NK92 cell line or umbilical cord blood can be a source of these cells and induce pluripotent stem cells also. So, um, so now, as compared to CAR T cell therapy, NK cell therapy is being is being uh, touted as the next best thing to use. Although the CAR T cell therapy is very effective in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. There is a dendritic cell. I showed you the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell was discovered by um, by uh, this uh, Rockefeller scientist, and he um, actually Ralph Steinman. When he discovered the um, uh, the cell, the dendritic cells, he never dreamt that it would have this kind of application. So the dendritic cells, what they are done is uh, this uh, Engelman actually took these uh, immune cells, the dendritic cells from patients, their own patients. Expose them to PAP, which is prostatic acid phosphatase. It's a, it's a molecule of the prostate cancer cells, and educated these cells that these uh, please take care of these antigens, the cells with these antigens. And these um, the T cells then bound to these dendritic cells, got trained to come and kill the cancer cells. So they would come and kill the prostate cancer cells. So this is Provenge, which is in the market. It's marketed as Provenge. So this, this was also a great progress, which is made up that has saved many people. These, let me emphasize that these cellular therapies are expensive. But as research goes on, this cost is gradually coming down. And so Prevax and FEC then are the two dendritic cell therapies available in the market. Now coming to stem cells, stem cells have also been used. The stem cells when they're during after fertilization, there is a zygote. Here, this cell of the zygote is called totipotent because it can become any cell type. And uh, the early embryo, it can become these cells can become of any cell type. And pluripotent cells are the ones we can that can become some of the cell types, not all. Then finally, uh, Shinya Yamanaka from Japan, he made a discovery that he can take skin cells and put some factors, put some um, growth factors and make them go back on time. They can actually go back to time zero and start differentiating. So this CVD is on coaching, which has now been replaced by CVN. And so he, this IPS, which is called induced pluripotent stem cell, adult stem cells, and he won the Nobel Prize for this because it was a seminal discovery in 2012. So these adult stem cells are also used for various purposes. Now, the first cellular transplant, this is a bit of history, was done by Donald Thomas in, um, in, in uh, I think, in 1957. Yes. After the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing in 1945, there was an increased interest in looking at what radiation can cause and how one can alleviate the problems related to radiation uh, effects. So um, Thomas actually pioneered the use of bone marrow transplant in leukemia patients. What he used to do is to first radiate and get rid of all the cancer cells, then put in the uh, fresh marrow cells. In one instance, it's, it was from a twin. And in uh, 1967, 10 years later, it was from a relative. Now, at that point of time, the concept of mismatch, tissue mismatch, was not there. And we didn't know about HLA molecules, which later we came to know. And now we can tissue match and get the donors who are not our twins or relatives. So bone marrow transplantation and its sister therapy, blood stem cell transplantation, actually have boosted survival rates from 0 to 90% of many blood cancers. So Donnell got, uh, Donnell got the Nobel Prize for um, Physiology or Medicine in 1990 for this discovery. Now, there are some hematopoietic stem cell-based therapies. So what is hematopoietic stem cells? Hematopoietic stem cells are stem cells available in our bone marrow who are making blood. So uh, the Silvelis is one where uh, a cell is deficient in adenosine and laminase and blood cells cannot form. So genetic engineering can be used to, uh, to induce this gene 
and stringbalism therapy, which is which consists of a single intravenous infusion of autologous uh, genetically engineered cells. And Zintelibo is for thalassemia patients when there is a mutation in the beta globulin gene, and uh, you don't require uh, lifelong transfusions now because these uh, these cells from you can be uh, engineered to express beta globulin and and recycle back to the person, and therefore the, the thalassemia can be cured. Mesenchymal stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells are cells, blood cells that can be uh, gotten from the bone marrow, and there are so many of them. This cartilage degeneration, myocardial infarction, subcutaneous tissue de de defects, Crohn's disease, spinal cord injury, and more. And uh, this uh, graft versus host disease can be cured. So um, these are some of the progresses that has been made in mesenchymal stem cell based therapies. Now, mesenchymal stem cells can also grow cartilage in the knee. Where what is done is the mesenchymal stem cells are loaded with uh, furocarbotrin, and they they are they can be attracted by magnets. So these cells are introduced systemically, but you are holding a magnet near the knee. And what happens in from the systemic uh, circulation, these cells come and home in of the knee. You can also inject the stem cells in the knee directly, and they come and home in there. And the mesenchymal stem cells would grow and give rise to the cartilage uh, defect in the knee, uh, to correct the cartilage defect in the knee. So, this is also one advan uh, advancement we've made with the uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And the ongoing trial for uh, cell therapies are a huge number are going on. And so, uh, the most of it is from the immune system diseases. And uh, because there are these, these blood cancers and all, they are all immune system defects eventually. So there are, on, there are a number of ongoing trials. But interestingly, what is predicted is that because of treatment, diagnostics, and research, the market for cell therapy is going to be $60 billion in 2030. So it's a huge market. And why is that? Because there are rising incidences of chronic disorders and infections, there is an increase in number of companies. There are many spin-offs, many startups for indulging in cell therapies. There are a growing number of research studies and clinical trials. Like it looks so attractive that if I had the time, or I was young like you, I would go and uh, start, uh, you know, innovating on this. And then adoption of innovative latest technologies that are coming out by these companies. And over 900 companies are working on advanced therapeutics, and 1,000 cell or gene therapy clinical studies are now being conducted. And it is said that uh, up to 60 new cell therapies are in the making and predicted to cure around 3,500 3, patients in the year alone. But one thing I must tell you all these clinical trials are fine, they're going on, they're given to people. But you know, if you're given clinical trial, maybe then you have 100 people. But maybe 50 of them will die. You know, ALL, it has happened. So there is, it's not like just putting a uh, 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 chandrayaan on the moon. It is totally different. This is where it is a lot of pain. There is a lot of effort. There is a lot of commitment in curing these, um, you know, in curing, in taking out the cure. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of pain because if you read, the stories of these individuals, if you read the stories of these trials, you'll see what it takes to make a drug. It's really, really uh, you know, intriguing how we are carrying on with this. But the, the scenario looks very optimistic because we are, our understanding is increasing day by day. Lastly, I wanted to mention about organoids. Organoids are actually three dimensional tissues grown in the petri dish. Um, they resemble organ in beings, so they are, they can be developed from pluripotent stem cells or adult stem cells. And this method allows for potential reprogramming of cells from patients. Suppose suppose one has a tumor, so when, during biopsy the material is taken out. These tumors can be miniature tumors, can be grown outside the body, and drugs can be tested to see which drug is suitable for the given patient. And this is what is called personal health. So this can happen. And organoids 
uh, you know, can be grown in a very short time. And even you can do a drug screening, a genetic screening, and gene editing of this. The brain organite, this is a brain organite, uh, which is grown on the uh, extracellular matrix, which has no animal component. So it's totally human. Now, uh, the organites can be grown from, uh, you know, em embryonic stem cells, from adult stem cells, and gastrointestinal organoid, cardiac organoid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera blood vessel organoids, optic cup organoids. So all these organoids can be grown. So this is what is called mini brain. These are brain grown in vitro. And if you look at this picture, the color coded, it's like the dendrites are showing as green, the uh, uh, forebrain uh, telencephalic cells are, are blue, and then uh, their cell, cell cell contacts are identified by type junctions, which is in red. So here, really, we can see these brains. It's not going to be a brain that you think of, but it's a stuff. And so the organoid applications are many. They, they can be used for, um, you know, disease, to study disease mechanism, to look at toxicology of a given drug, like uh, to, uh, for developmental stem cell biology and regenerative medicine, like whether we can generate tissue, gener generate organs, and then drug discovery and, of course, infectious diseases. But there are some obstacles. The inability to fully stimulate, simulate in vitro microenvironment. You can imagine if you're going to your cells in a, in, a, in a petri dish, you may not get total vascularization. You may not get a typical gut. But these are now being encountered by something which is called 3D printing. Because they are, the cells grow in a particular scaffold. This is, this is the container in which the cells will grow. And they are forced to grow in a particular scaffold after growing the blood cells. And then the printing is done layer by layer. So very soon you're going to get chips which has your organs. So then chips can be used for many different purposes. I wanted to leave with a picture of a organoid, which is a heart, heart organoid. Now the heart organoid, with the cells are beating by the heart cell, rhythmic beating but they cannot pop blood. So now they're using scaffold to grow the vascularization first and then growing the organ aid on it. And we can look for an uh, 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 interesting future in this. So thank you very much. What I have actually told is tip of the iceberg. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the literature, huge number. Yes. Thank you for your nice picture. Uh, actually, I'm really curious to know about uh, the status of the treatment of. Uh, uh, you told about uh, the treatment of uh, thalassemia present some uh, uh, alternative to blood transfusion. Yes. So what is the status of that? Uh, because I see uh, blood transfusion is uh, the normal way. Uh, but the yes. is still, uh, still they're using blood transmission because this is a little expensive. Because here, what is done is your cells, the, blood, the bone marrow stem cells are taken out, and you introduce the beta globin gene there. And then these cells are put back in the marrow so that now these cells proliferate. And so this Zintel book, which is called Zintel book, the, it, is, it is available in the market. But the problem is it's too expensive, so most people go for blood transmission. And we are hoping that with time, these prices are going to come down. Thanks for the really nice talk. I'm just curious, uh, is it understood that how this, uh, this natural killer cells or T cells, how do they distinguish between the native cells versus the foreign trade cells? Yes. Uh, so how, how they recognize or distinguish, is it understood? Yes, uh, see the CD19 marker, CD19 molecule, which is, which is uh, overexpressed on the 
uh, tumor cells. So, you know, it is always there is this problem of having some of it on the normal cells as well. But they are making, by putting on these post stimulators and all that, they're making it that they should go to the tumor cells only because there a huge number of CD19 is expressed. So there are four trials which are based on recognition of the RT cells for CD19. And there are two for other tumor antigens. So it is thought that if uh, everything goes all right, the tumors can be taken out and antigen analysis can be done, which is a very, which is still now time consuming. And then a particular construct can be made for a particular antigen. In that case, it will not affect the normal cells. But like any other treatment, like general chemotherapy or any other treatment, there is some degree of cross-reactivity, but mostly it is the tumor cells which are targeted. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a very fascinating talk. I don't know where it's the future, but is it the you know the brain which is the most complex part? If someone you know, very often people becomes brain dead because of their some accident or something. Is, it's of course far more complex than what has been discussed and probably more futuristic. So is there any kind of cell therapy idea if you have a brain dead? You know, all of these uh, cell therapy, they are aiming towards the brain eventually, you know, the creation of mini brain. And this is particularly because of this glioblastoma, because the glioblastoma is a brain tumor that is being attempted to grow it in vitro and then send uh, targeted uh, drugs. But brain, as you know, is very complicated, very, very complicated. So eventually target is the brain, because that's what is born. Now it's affecting almost everybody everywhere. So um, the last picture I showed you is a brain organoid, and they're expecting that that will help us to understand also how the cells communicate. See, the whole, whole branch of cell therapy came because of the understanding that cells talk to each other. And we can actually interfere in there. So with the brain, I think it's a it's a tall task, but somewhere um, we will be doing something. Glioblastoma, yeah, they're already trying. Well, so that's that's very interesting. You know, all this even Parkinson, Alzheimer, yes. all... Parkinson's on Alzheimer's are in the main focus now because the number of people having Parkinson's or Alzheimer's are growing. Uh, nice talk, ma'am. Ma'am, actually, uh, you wrote that uh, we can make uh, a cell uh, uh, travel uh, backwards in time and then uh, make it suitable for any organ we know we, we want to culture or something like that so uh, could you please uh, explain on that thing yes so uh, when a, when a, i mean these are done, done with fibroblasts and then so there it's a differentiated cell now you can put if you look at the procedure now you can put all these growth factors and as i said that in case of humans now it's a different growth factor they are using you can put back the cell to time zero. So now the cell, the cell is a totipotent cell. It can grow in any uh, any of the organs you want. So normally, the stem cell therapy would have um, would have some stimulators to make it grow towards uh, you want to grow a liver, you want to grow heart cells, you want to grow uh, hair follicles. So that can be done. There, there is a plethora of uh, agents that can do that. So this is how it is made. Yeah. So uh, fantastic. So we just discussed about the stem cell uh, just before that before your talk, right? So we're just wondering that you know, like, do you know the mechanism that how unipotent goes to pluripotent or pluripotent goes to totipotent? And in terms of uh, stem, like you know, stem cell therapy. So how that could be interesting in future. Stem cell therapy is you can use embryos only up to the eight cell stage, and you can take out the cells and you know grow them to make any again using those stimulators to go uh, any way they want. Uh, but how uh, 
how a pluripotent goes to pluripotent is through programming, is through inherent programming, because that is how it's supposed to be. That there's a fertilization, there's a zygote, and the zygote is supposed to. The opposite one. Which one? Pluripotent to Is that possible? Pluripotent to totipotent it can only happen with uh, the fibroblasts, with those, uh, those uh, you know. There's an interesting question that how does it go back? Really? Exactly, that's what I want but uh, but what, whatever we know a little bit about it, that it changes the profile of the of the transcription factors, and that's how it takes it back. Actually, the thing is that there is a epigenetic cells. If we can reverse that epigenetic influence, automatically the new uh, the earlier genes that is shut down due to the epigenetic control, it can be again start see synthesized. So, so the main thing. And by using the transcription, so and both factors and transcription factor, we can reverse back the cell in the towards the back. back. Yeah. I think this discussion this can is continue yeah. over the it, change. It looks like a science fiction, no? <laughs> but it has become a reality. Okay. That's a good question. So, it's not quite. Oh, yeah. No, no. This is a nice question. Uh, you talk about uh, there is a huge number of cells that are dying every day and born. What can we do in everyday life so that that balance is maintained properly? This is a question that is a very, uh, I would say this is a question that we talk about our health. Why are we exercising? So why are we eating well? Because everything you know, the nutrients that are going towards us, inside us, it's going to cells for their nourishment. Huh? Cells will die because if you don't let the cells die, then you will have tumors, this uh, autoimmune diseases and things like that. So it is in general, what can you do? You, you know, I cannot say because there is no such formula as what can you do to stop cells from uh, dying because you cannot, uh, you should not be letting them uh, inhibiting the dead, you should have healthy cells growing, and that's through nutrition, through exercise, through you know, uh, through maintaining good lifestyle. So that's how it is. In general, exactly mechanism. One doesn't. So, uh, before we close, uh, we request our director to present this paper to the speaker. So much. We don't know enough. Thank, Thank you. Thank you once again for the brilliant. Thank you. <laughs>